the Zoom is yours. Thanks, Sophia. Hi, everyone. I now need to add to my bio, actually, this residency and the fact that I'm the uh, employee number one of CSP, which I'm very, very proud to be part of this family. Um, maybe just a moment before we launch into what I want to talk with you about today. Um, first of all, a quick disclaimer. This is the first time this is built for you guys, it's the first time I'm giving this specific talk. When I wrote the paragraph, like afterwards looking at it, I was like, great, I wrote a paragraph that describes a semester. Uh, maybe I need to narrow down a little. So we will talk today about performance art and religion, but specifically Jewish religion and tradition. So that's kind of, and daily acts will come in there, but one day when I have a full course, maybe I'll touch also on Christianity, Islam, and Zen Buddhism, who def definitely take a part in this, but let's kind of stay in a scope of one hour today. Um, so that's what's going to happen today. And just before uh, we start, I want to ask you to drop in the chat. The chat, as Sophia mentioned, is open for everyone. Um, what are your associations of performance art? Do you know what it is? Do you not know what it is? Like this, this uh, will be a great way for me to kind of just understand where we're at. Feel free to say, I have no idea what it is. I know, but not sure. I know and I love it. I know and I hate it. Can you just like give me some idea of, of as a group where we're at with when I say performance art, okay? So when I say performance art, what comes to your mind? Just drop it in the chat. No one's judging. Okay, so a question, did it evolve from kinetic art? Unclear, perfect. What else? Not sure. Acting, lovely. A person doing something weird and taping it. Street art, not familiar with performance art. Perfect. By the way, thank you. I do want to say that to me, the first step of knowledge is actually admitting what we don't know and recognizing it so that we can start figuring it out. Uh, acting music, uh, making a statement in real time, interesting, activist protest. Um, I've liked it, movement sometimes to music. I've seen performance years ago, my daughter did, not sure. Is that when art is displayed in a venue? Anything that has movement, breath, real life or so. Move okay, you are amazing. And if you look through the chat, you kind of, I think you grab a lot of things um, around it. And I I love here this comment by uh, Va Klansky, uh, Klanasi. She says, my association of performance art is leading prayer during Shabbat services, interdisciplinary, transformed and expanded prayer. A cappella, visual, and divrei Torah midrashim. Rea says, not a picture on a canvas, meaningful interaction with artists and viewer. Okay, this is amazing. So thank you, everyone. Uh, these comments are precious, truly, because it's spanning actually everything from having no clue to giving real exact identifiers and trying to figure out also what's the relationship between that and other forms of art that we know and between that and other, like you said, protest and activists, so um, other things. So what I'm gonna do now, I'm gonna launch into my presentation. For the time I'm speaking, I won't be looking at the chat because I can't do both uh, well, but I will ask, um, I will ask questions. When I ask questions, I'll I'll look at the chat. So I'm going to share the screen now. Um, okay, share. No, wrong one. One moment, right one. Let me just see. Sophia, can you see this uh, in, in a large screen? Yeah, it's fine. So what we're going to do today, actually, is we're going to go... I, um, we're gonna figure out the roots of performance art. So by the end of our time together, you not only will know what performance art is, you'll also know how it started, what are the main things. And then we're gonna transition, I think midway or a little after midway, we're gonna transition into um, the relationship between performance art and performance art at religion and religion and end with a question about this uh, relationship that ha has is even, receiving new turns uh, in the last few years. So 
this is not what you're seeing here is not a performance art, but it's a good, it's a crucial turning point and it's kind of setting the stage. Uh, this is the fountain or urinal by Marcel Duchamp presented in the museum in 1917 at a moment where uh, basically with, with this work we have kind of a statement that art is no longer necessarily about craftsmanship, right? This urinal is made by a factory and is no longer about beauty because there isn't much beauty about this. In this case, art is A, defined by what the professional artistic community deems as art and makes it into the museum. And the artist's role in this is more of a conceptual and bringing forth not the question of beauty, but the question of thought, of the ability to look at our world in, in a new way. So this is a pivotal point, and we're going to go through a few landmarks that will help us reach all the way to performance art. Up, oh, yes. This is another major la landmark within the uh, Dada pre-surrealist uh, movement, uh, a work by Hannah Hoch, who, by the way, is one of the most famous collage artists and Jewish. Um, the name of this work is cut with a kitchen knife through the last Weimar be beer belly cultural epoch in Germany. Why am I bringing you this work as a kind of pre pre-setting the scene for performance art? For a few reasons. First of all, in this collage, what she's using are using are bits and pieces from magazines uh, of the time. But if you look at the title, what she's doing is very very um, central to the work itself. She's giving us kind of the era, what's going on, but she's also giving us the action and the tool, which obviously this, this was not cut with a kitchen knife, right? It was cut probably with scissors, but the moment she writes that cut with the kitchen knife, what we basically have as a central part of this work is the action, the process of creating the work, and we have a location because it's very hard not to imagine a kitchen when we read the title. And at that point also, who was in the kitchen? The women. So she's kind of challenging who's doing art, the process of making art, and the relationship between the outcome, the collage itself, which is very large. Oh, I'm seeing it's in inches, I, uh, in centimeters and not inches, I apologize. Um, a very, very large work, but she's putting the emphasis on the process itself. And here we see a huge shift, right? I'm skipping forward <laughs> in big leaps in time with Jackson Pollock. This is, a, a, these are photographs of him in the studio in 1950. And another moment where there's a very important shift from the outcome that needs to stand alone to the process of art making, which becomes as significant as the art itself, right? There, there's this shift within the art world between product and process and the relationship between them. If you think, I'll just go back, back, back for a moment. If you think of Renaissance paintings, it's about how good they are at the end. We're less aware or interested in what happened during the process. If you think of Jackson Pollock, um, the, the painting itself became becomes like its importance, its concept come from the process. And now we're skipping uh, a little further forward. This is from 1952, a performance by pianist Wilman, William Marx of John Cage for 33. I do want to ask, I'm asking here uh, in the chat, and I'll see how I can, uh, one moment. Okay, I just want to see uh, in the chat, if you can tell me, does anyone know uh, this piece by, uh, by John Cage? Is there anyone familiar? Just you can write, if you are familiar, write yes. If not, we'll know. Uh, yes. Okay. Good. So we're not going to see the full piece, um, but I do want us to see a little bit uh, of it, and then I'll say a few words. And now a performance of John Cage's 433. Please welcome our soloist, William Marx.
So I'm going to stop this and say a few words. I think even, especially in our day and age, even these uh, few seconds of nothing happening um, are full of tension in a way. We're very, very I, I don't know, just check in with yourself how fast you lost attention because nothing was moving very, very fast. In this work by John Cage, uh, which wouldn't necessarily be related to as performance art, but could be, what we have is the form without the content. It's uh, the length is four minutes and 33 seconds. It is uh, um, can be performed by an orchestra or by one uh, player, but basically it includes getting on stage, getting everything prepared and then not playing. So I wanna ask you for a moment, since there isn't playing, what what is the piece about? What happens when there's none of that playing? I'm just looking at the chat. So just write to me, what do you think? Or what did you notice during that one minute of viewing that we had? Okay, the expectation and breaking our expectations. Perfect, what else? Our imagine so exactly so it's not only only our imagination but there is an emphasis on us as viewers right it's no longer held on stage and we are the audience we become part of it there's the sense of anticipation and preparation absolutely and what are the sounds of this piece the sounds of this piece are actually whatever happens in the room I love yes and Toby is saying confusing. Confusion, everything except the core. Perfect. So, um, okay. And the difference between what you expect and what really happens. And I want to touch on that because there's really, uh, and one of you said at the beginning with performance art, you wrote acting. And there is a huge difference between acting and performance art because performance art is really, really trying to touch on what is real and what is happening now, rather on content that is external or symbolic of what is happening. So um, this work uh, is one of the kind of, one moment, I just wanna, yes. Okay, we're moving forward to 1961. Um, these look like regular paintings, right? They're called shootings, uh, if you can see the title. They're by uh, artist Nikki de Saint Palais, and they were created like this. Um, basically having on the canvas these balloons with paint and the artist shooting at them. And so the paint drips and, cre and, and creates these paintings. Another reference, I mean, you can see to what Jackson Pollock did in terms of the process and the result, but he also bringing very much this image of the woman shooting a rifle at the paintings and kind of charging the paintings themselves with this action. Uh, we're going to take a moment at uh, this uh, piece, uh, a few a few minutes of uh, documentation of this piece from 1962 by Yves Klein. It's going to help us understand the image that we saw before and a few things about the social uh, aspects of the movement of performance art. The video, the quality of the video is poor because it's 1962. So uh, excuse that. We're going to see uh, a minute or two of this and then I'll explain. Ah, uh, one moment, not this. Uh, this, why is it not here? The late Czechoslovakian painter Eve Klein is ready. Okay, so I'm going to talk as the video is running. So you saw the artist Eve Klein with the orchestra at the beginning. Again, a full orchestra, but it's playing a flat one note. So we can know already from John Cage that it's taking this place of what an orchestra can do and taking just the 
the basic note of it. And then during the performance, we have these women coating themselves in uh, blue paint. And you'll see in a moment, then imprinting their image on the canvas. Now it's very easy to see in the performance that the artist is kind of the conductor and the creator of this work. Whereas the women are like doing his will or performing what he wants to do. If you think of this, this is very much a continuation of women of the, as the muse, as models, and men creating the art. And now through this, we can start understanding the performance art that really erupted in the US in the 1960s with women taking the reins from themselves. So I'm, so I'm gonna go back for a moment and now you can start seeing how at the time these images were very, very important and how performance art is really rooted in the, uh, in the feminist movement in women claiming kind of the act of creation, the act of making art to themselves rather than being just the ones that are the muse or depicted by the male gaze. So there's a shift of the gaze, there's a shift of uh, action. Another thing that happens um, at this time is also, as you know, what's going on uh, in Vietnam. And what we're going to see here is a very short, tiny, less than two minutes uh, kind of documentary about the work of Chris Burden, and then I'll say a few words uh, about it. Huh? Floor, and I, we had a line taped on the floor, and I stepped up to the line. He said, okay, ready, let's go. And I said, yep, let's, let's go. Then I aimed, and at the last instant, I, I guess I pulled a tiny bit to the left. He turned white pretty quickly. He, his lips kind of got blue almost and he, his face went white. I, I wasn't expecting that. Okay, so I want to ask you again uh, in the chat, this work by Chris Burden is a work, as you saw, from 1971. The person talking is his friend, John, who actually uh, Chris asked him to be the one to shoot him. Originally, they planned for it to just graze his arm, but he was off by a tiny bit. So the bullet actually uh, did a little more than grazing the arm. The performance itself was literally eight seconds long and there were very few people in the gallery. Chris Burden is actually a Californian artist. Uh, so this uh, uh, work happened uh, here in California. Uh, and then obviously the police report and everything. So what I wanna ask you for a moment to maybe uh, let me know in the chat, if you think, like, what do you think about this? Is this art or not? Uh, What's the point of all of this? What are the thoughts that come up for you when you see this piece? Just going to wait for a second for the comments to come because you've been doing really well here. So any thoughts, there's no wrong thoughts when seeing this. It's also quite a harsh uh, performance to see. Chris Burden is considered one of the major uh, performance artists for that time of body performance, of people uh, using their body as a canvas. So Cynthia is saying um, horror performance art is experiential, unpredictable. It is performance art, but I, you say a bit violent, it's very violent, right? Made very uncomfortable and it's very challenging. Uh, would never allow myself to be that vulnerable. To me, not art seems like this can entice violent. Uh, action not on the spur, but planned not in today's world of gun violence, uh, anger needlessly risky. Thank you for saying all of that. So all of these responses totally make sense. And basically what Chris Burden and many other artists of that time were starting to do was to figure out uh, the boundaries between performance art um, and life. 
and blurring them. These two men also served in the army. Um, they were marksmen. They saw a lot of people dying in Vietnam and guns and violence and the questions about the place of guns and violence in their life was a huge one. Chris Burden here, as you see him, um, uh, is 25 years old. And I think there is um, there are very powerful uh, comments uh, here. I have trouble with this type of performances. Art. Uh, 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 the eliciting of emotional uh, uh, response. So I think it's a it's a huge question, right? About do we risk our lives, our bodies for art? Uh, what is the place of art? What is the place of artists? Where where do the limits uh, go uh, in this? So what we're gonna see, we're gonna uh, watch a short clip of Marina Abramovich, uh, one of the major performance artists of today, um, actually uh, giving us a way to look at the very extreme performances uh, of that time. So we're gonna listen to a few words of hers uh, relating to the performance rhythm, rhythm Zero that she conducted in 1974. One of my most extreme pieces was when I really pushed my body to the limits because I did never want to die. I'm not interested in dying, but they're interested in how far you can push the energy of the human body, how far you can go and then see that that actually our energy is almost limitless. It's not about the body, it's about the mind who push you to the extremes that you never could imagine. Some of the work that really got lots of attention to the public was uh, Rhythm Zero. Uh, till that time, the artist uh, performance art was totally uh, ridiculous. And the thing that was sick and there was exhibitionist and was masochist, and they just want attention. So I was just really tired of this kind of critics. And I said, okay, I'm going to make the piece to see how far public can go if the artist himself doesn't do anything. And there very simply, um, I uh, put on the table 72 objects with the instructions, I'm an object, you can do whatever you want to do with me. And uh, I will take all responsibility for six hours. On the table was a rose, a perfume, a piece of bread and grapes and wine. And, and then was objects like uh, really scissors and nails and uh, metal bar. And uh, finally, it was also a pistol with one bullet. So, so basically, if you listen to the beginning, she says at that point, performance art and performance artists were ridiculed and being seen as people that are trying to get attention and stuff like that. And she created this performance in a way to also bring it back to the people and say, this is exploring the human body. It's exploring social constructs. Uh, as she mentioned, there were 72, 72 objects on the table and uh, she allowed people to do with her for six hours, whatever they wanted. The performance ended er early because after a few hours that are quite, uh, I'm, I'm not even bringing it here because it is very, very hard to see. Um, the gallerist ended the performance because one of the people actually took the gun with the one bullet in it and uh, put it against the head. And that's when the gallerist stopped the performance. But we can see here with the extreme, she's saying it's not about us artists being extreme. It's about us using our body to, to be a mirror and show what's going on in the world, what society is capable of, what people are capable of, and a mirror of the violence and a question about it. Um, another work that kind of brings us to the totality of art, and we will be uh, jumping soon into religion and asking about all of these concept, concepts that are coming up, uh, is this rope piece by Linda Montano and Tishing Heish. Um, they are not a couple, they were never a couple. Um, two performing artists who decided to tie themselves one to another with this rope that is just under two meters long for a full year. Yes, a full year, 1983 to 1984. You're seeing two images of this. You're seeing the document. You're seeing two witnesses that signed that uh, on the day this happened. They are not partners. They weren't partners. This is also, by the way, the only work that they created together. Um, 
But as you can see, it begs the question, this totality, okay, but what's the point? Like why, to what extreme will artists go to figure out, in this case, we're talking about a relationship, about intimacy and proximity, just even the thought of how do you manage life like this? How do you sleep? How do you shower? How do you go to the bathroom? How do you eat? What happens to two people that are tied together in this way? And I'm going to leave these questions of totality open and actually allow our religion to answer them. But we're kind of starting to see that, especially in those beginning 20 years of performance art, the interest was then in the extreme side and the place of the body in art. We're moving to Israel with this work from 1973 by artist Moti Mizrahi, the Via Dolorosa. Uh, this artist um, had uh, was sick with polio uh, when he was 16. So the crutches are something until today that he uses. And he's carrying here on the streets of, streets of Jerusalem on his back, his own self-portrait, walking through the streets of Jerusalem and actually in the steps of the Via Dolorosa and actually asking this question of, what is the place of the artist? Um, what do they carry themselves in their art? What is the sacrifice they make for society and what is their role uh, in it? You can see the conversation here also that he has along the way. And obviously, if you think of uh, his disability and walking through the path of the Via Dolorosa, this is uh, not such an easy uh, task to have. And especially also having that kind of image uh, of himself that he's carrying with him. Another very famous work uh, from that same time, same uh, uh, is uh, by Efrat Natan. This is a work called Milk. It's from 1974. And if you think of it, especially in Israel at that time, we're post the Yom Kippur War. Um, the country is in really in bits and pieces. People lost loved ones. The thought uh, or the understanding of what happens hits everyone. And Efrat Natan, in this uh, performance piece, she sits at the top of uh, these stairs, which are really just kind of any typical Israeli uh, uh, staircase. And she pours these jugs of milk uh, down the staircase, afterwards also cleaning them, leaning into a very um, a common Hebrew phrase, lo bochim al chalav shenishpach, uh, one doesn't cry over spilt milk. Maybe that's also an English phrase, I'm not sure. Um, but also a likening the, the milk to blood that is spilt and kind of the waste of what happened uh, with the war. We're moving forward, we're skipping to 1997 to this work, uh, Dinner Dress uh, or Debating Dora by Tamara Ban, one of the very central figures of performance art in Israel. This was performed in different venues um, in Vienna and in Israel. And you see here, uh, the, this performance uh, had 24 participants that had a full meal around this table that she was the centerpiece of with um, pieces of text and food all uh, talking about uh, the artist's uh, the artist's mother. Uh, so you can see in this way that the performance art, again, is placing the viewers less as audience and more as part of what is happening. It's challenging, in this case, all forms of mediums into one. And in all of them, as you notice now, it's happening in real time. And it's very hard to say here what is real and what is art. We're going to watch, uh, and I'm skipping here a lot in time, we're going to watch a few moments of this work uh, from uh, 2011 by Ohad Pishov. Oh, one moment. <laughs> Again, I just want you to notice, first of all, what happens to us when things slow down, uh, when I'm not giving information at high speed, when we're not scrolling, when we're seeing an image that moves very, very slowly. The person here in white, uh, or kind of, it's not like a festive white, it's very, um, kind of daily clothes, but are in white. He's walking through Rothschild Boulevard uh, at the time of the social protest of 2011. He's walking very, very slowly. Some people decide to 
walk behind him. Um, it's not something that was part uh, necessarily of the performance. They could, they couldn't, he, he could keep walking. And I do want to ask you for a moment, uh, if you can uh, tell me in the chat, um, what do you think happens when someone is walking at this pace in like the normal movement of the city? What does it make us um, aware of? I'm gonna stop this for a moment so I can just see the chat. One moment, ooh, there's a lot going on here. Um, okay, so no, the, there is a person here with crutches, but that's just uh, a person with crutches. He's walking slowly and Marilyn is saying, you, you, we become aware of time, absolutely. It's destructive, which is really funny, right? Because he's just walking very slowly. But yeah, if in a big city, someone walks very slowly, it becomes destructive. Uh, disconnect, disassociation, um, right. But there's something, I love this. Um, uh, people who are moving at a normal pace get annoyed and walk around them. So, so there again, there's something, even though this movement isn't violent in any way, notice that in all of the things that we saw, including this one, there's an element of disrupting, right? Of, of entering normal, the normal fabric and pace of life um, and causing some kind of a disruption that makes us uh, either aware or we try and uh, move on uh, and kind of uh, ignore it. Um, I want us to kind of look at another piece by Marina Abramovic. It's very hard these days, by the way, to do any uh, talk about performance art without referring back and forth to Marina Abramovic because she's really this major uh, presence. Uh, this work is called The Artist is Present. Um, I will say there are better uh, video documentations of this work, but they're all very, very polished and I don't like them. So I'm getting you this one, which actually isn't polished. It's just someone taking uh, a video of what's going on there. So I'm going to show it to you for a few moments and then we're going to talk about it. So I'm gonna let it go uh, as I'll explain a little. This was uh, part of a, a huge retrospective held for her works um, in 2010 in the MoMA in New York. And for three months, for the whole duration of opening times in the MoMA, uh, Marina Abramovic sat at that chair. And every time someone sat in front of her, she lifted her uh, face, opened her eyes and looked at them. People could sit for however long they wanted until they left and then the next person in line came in and people could stand around and watch. Um, and the name of this performance is uh, The Artist is Present. And I wanna ask you in this way, uh, right, people were waiting in line for hours to sit with her. Um, how would you describe the, the role of the artist in this work? If you had to... Uh, describe the role of the artist what is she what what's going on here what is her role acknowledging presence beautiful the artist is human being a vessel uh was her yes her head was down and eyes closed between people the artist as observer being present recognizing individuality connection beautiful so many of these things and bringing forward something that is very, very central um, for performance art is the body itself, the presence itself of the body and the artist uh, creating space. Um, I love that what Taibel just wrote, a very narcissistic approach to art. So we're gonna touch on that because we can notice that in all performance art, uh, the artist's body 
and person and personality are part of the work and i'll put a question mark there is it narcissism or it might it be something else i'm going to put a question mark and there again we're going to answer through uh religion we're going to go a little forward um well no didn't want this to happen next one yes um to this work and we're kind of pivoting a little a little to this work by Raflam Haddad that was uh, um, also performed both in uh, Jerusalem and in other places um, in the world. I will mention that at CSP we're bringing Raflam Haddad, I don't know if I'm allowed to say it yet, but we're bringing this artist to uh, Orange County. Um, I might have revealed uh, uh, the secret too early. Um, but Raflam Haddad is a Jewish Israeli Tunisian artist who has been living in Tunis for the last eight years and deals a lot with his works with social justice and food. And in this work, we are seeing the one that was on the uh, rooftop of one of Jerusalem houses. And I have the privilege of being at this work. Uh, he grew crops um, and created food and people were invited to kind of break bread with him, have eat something and talk about the migration of food, of how things are, are going around the world in terms of food and the labor uh, around it. Um, again, in this, the artist is definitely a central part, but we can see that there's already the spectator is actually a participant. The location is not in a white cube or a gallery or museum. The context of where it's happening relating both to specifically where it is, but also to what's happening in our world globally and totally expanding what we might think that uh, art is. Uh, this work by Tino Segal um, that was performed uh, in 2003 in the Guggenheim and just a few months ago in the Tel Aviv Museum of Art, you're seeing this picture on the right is actually with a gum behind the couple uh, kissing uh, in Tel Aviv Museum of Art. And in this work, there are couples, they might be uh, same sex or, or opposite sex couples um, kissing for the whole duration of the opening hours of museum, but following famous kisses in uh, art history, whether it's Rodin or Brancusi, uh, Klimt, there are many, many kisses. And basically the choreography is uh, based on kisses that are famous throughout art history. Um, what happens in this work is basically, since this is happening uh, in a very public space, that people come and they watch, right? And we turn again into voyeurs of the experience. We're looking at an intimate act in public space. Um, originally, I will say when Tino Segal started this work, his... Um, um, he had a condition that performers uh, that were doing this work would be a couple uh, in real life. He has since dropped <laughs> that requirement, but people do need to apply together to be part of this work. And we're moving to something that is happening right now and a lot of fun in uh, Tel Aviv Museum of Art, which is an exhibition by Irvin Worm. Um, and you can see here kind of one of the iterations uh, of this work. Uh, there's always a drawing with a kind of instruction and the person put in themselves here. Um, this is a, an installation uh, view of the exhibition. You can see the people over here and over here. Unlike many of the works that we just saw, this is full of humor, right? Uh, it takes the body and sculpting to a place more of humor and less of the drama and the violence. And I do want us to see a few moments from um, uh, uh, an interview uh, with uh, the head curator of Tel Aviv Museum uh, of Art, Mira Lapidot, and with uh, Irvin Worm, I skipped to the part that I uh, wanted you to see, just so we can hear a little from him. As we all know, the traditional notion of a sculpture is a piece of art, stone, wood, whatever stands on a pedestal. The one minute sculptures are sculptures, but short living sculptures. So uh, the most important thing is it's a person involved and an object, mostly a daily life object. I invite them to perform after my instructions and to stand for a short period of time quiet. Because they are so ephemeral, I try to create something where they could exist longer. I asked people to organize Polaroids and we made Polaroids of the of the people performing. Then they could better take it home or we pin it, pinned it on the wall. 
And this was the beginning. But you know, now it's very different. Now we don't use uh, Polaroids anymore because everybody is constantly following his own life with a with an with a phone. They are the paparazzi by himself, and that's so <laughs> fantastic. And that's the one that is capture. So we have here again uh, a place where performance art, art and sculpting are coming kind of uh, together in this way. Um, but again, we can see these same uh, concepts or ideas of the human body being an integral part of what is happening and testing the limits, the abilities, what it evokes, and in all of them also real time and what's happening uh, in real time. So what I want to do now, we're going to take all of these questions that came up and we're going to have a dramatic shift <laughs> to Ezekiel. Uh, you didn't see that coming, did you? Um, to Ezekiel 4. Um, and uh, in it, uh, God gives uh, Ezekiel the following instruct instructions. I just realized I always read it in Hebrew. I'm going to try and do my best reading this in English. And you, O mortal, take a brick and put it in front of you and incise on it a city, Jerusalem. So set up a siege against it. We're talking against a brick, right? Ezekiel, at this point when he receives this prophecy, isn't even in the land of Israel. He is actually in Babylonia, okay? Set a siege against it and build towers against it and cast a mound against it pitch camps against it and bring it up battering rams round about it. Then take an iron plate and place it as an iron wall between yourself and the city and set your face against it. Thus it shall be under siege. You shall besiege it. This shall be an omen for the house of Israel. Then lie on your, listen to this carefully, then lie on your left side and let it bear the punishment of the house of Israel for as many days as you lie on it, you shall bear their pan punishment. For I impose upon you 390 days corresponding to the number of years of their punishment. And so you shall bear the punishment of the house of Israel. When you have completed these, you shall lie another 40 days on your right side and bear the punishment of the house of Judea. I impose on you one day for each year. Then with bared arms, set your face towards besieged Jerusalem and prophesy against it. Now I put cords upon you so that you cannot turn from side to side until you complete these days of siege. We're going to go one slide forward. Just realize you have this here, a bread name Ezekiel 4.9. It's actually coming from these verses over here. Um, Further, take wheat, barley, beans, lentils, millet, and emmer. Put them into one vessel and bake them into bread. Eat it as many days as you lie on your side, 390. The food that you eat shall be by weight, 20 shekels a day. This you shall eat in the space of a day, and you shall drink water by measure. Drink a sixth of a hin in the space of a day. Eat it as a barley cake. You shall bake it on human excrement before their eyes. By the way, that part, Ezekiel protests to, to God that like human uh, excrement is a little too much and asked if he can do it on a cow's excrement. That was like his bartering with God at that point. But I do want you to consider for a moment First of all, that what we just read, and these are just one of two uh, depictions uh, of Ezekiel trying to fulfill what is literally a performance given to him uh, by God, right? He is not in the land of Israel. What do you think people who see this do? Because he's there, and not only for 365 days, which is one year, but rather 390 days plus 40 days. And there are quite a few things here that we can see that are actually in tune with what we understand today as performance art. He's using his body, he's using objects, he's destructing public space, right? People might ignore him, be annoyed at him, go around him, maybe stop for a moment, maybe try and convince him not to do this, probably ridicule him. But we're seeing that this relationship of one person embodying through extreme uh, measures 
some kind of message that is all like none of this is actually, you know, it's very hard to take anything here into action. And just before I move forward, I do want to ask you what you think when you see this. Just give it a second to see your thoughts. And what would happen if you'd see this uh, today in the city where you live, if someone would do this? Was he mentally ill? Ezekiel, we know him from the Bible as a prophet, but I think it's a beautiful question because very often we look at artists and what we do and we ask like, it's so extreme in relationship to what we consider normal life um, uh, that it is in a way a question. In this case, he's a biblical prophet following instructions from God. Uh, any other thoughts about this? Uh, uh, these actions that Ezekiel is performing based on the request of God? Um, interesting. So Taibel is saying the Tanakh text doesn't mean it literally. Yes or no, um, <laughs> we can, I, you know, we have here a text, a biblical text that describes an action which could totally be uh, a performance script. Um, um, Nancy here is saying a beautiful comment, I think, oddly, I am seeing homeless in my city, uh, of my city. And I think it's a beautiful comment to start a uh, understanding that or questioning what we see is outside of what we regard as normal life and what we as viewers, as spectators, as fellow humans, how are we viewing it um, and how are we regarding it? Are we pushing it away as mentally ill, as inappropriate, or are we able to see it in a different uh, uh, way? Uh, Ron is writing, it's symbolism, bringing attention to Jerusalem, uh, making people aware of where they came from. I think it's interesting to understand that the extremity of anything like this makes us feel uncomfortable, but is actually a call for attention, a call, a call for us to find some kind of new awareness in us to our uh, situation and where we are. So Victor Turner says uh, uh, this is a very condensed version of what he says about what ritual is, a stereotype sequence of activities involving gestures, words, and objects performed in, in sequestered place and designed to influence pre Pre uh, sorry, I usually read this in Hebrew. Uh, preternatural entities or forces on behalf of the actor's goals and interests. Societies are processes responsive to change. New rituals are born or borrowed while older ones decline. However, forms survive through flux and new ritual items. Even new ritual configurations tend more often to be variants of old themes than radical novelties. And I just wanted to take a look at this, which is actually um a ritual that i think many of the people here perform on quite a regular basis and consider it for a moment if you have seen if you would have stumbled across this ritual outside of a synagogue or a home context just on the street with people raising scents and fire and an object smelling looking at their hands and chanting would we not ask the same thing about that we just asked about Ezekiel and the performance artist? In this case, probably not, because we're aware of the cultural context, context and what these things are holding, but they have a very, very similar configuration. In all of them, there's also this very interesting thing where the we're not just viewers, we're not onlookers, but we're part of what is going on, which is very, very different from the traditional forms of art, whether it's sculpting or painting, where we are set apart from these uh, works, or if it's uh, theater or dance or music, where we are also apart from the things, we are audience. There's a wall between kind of what's going on on stage and between us, whereas in ritual, and in performance art, there is no wall. There is usually no separation with stage, but we become a part of it. Um, and in this way, um, I, I just want to skip here. 
Um, I want to say a few words also about the concept of minyan. Um, and uh, some of you mentioned with Marina Abramovich, the artist is present, uh, is present, how much the presence of the artist is part of it. If you think of a minyan, I just put here two, uh, two uh, images that I thought were uh, uh, interesting and funny and fun. Um, but if you think of a minyan, a minyan is counted not by what's going on in that person's mind, not by what they're wearing, not by what, how much, to what degree they believe in. It is counted simply by presence. Just by being present in a location, you can be counted. And this very similar to uh, performance art puts a huge emphasis on present, on being part of a specific moment. Um, I do wanna say one more thing. Um, and that is, uh, the, again, the relationship between uh, the performer and the viewers. And this relationship, which actually um, is a very similar one to what you know from a cantor and congregation um, in two ways. First of all, the cantor in a congregation is both themselves and the role that they play, right? They're not acting. And here it's very, you can really understand this. They're not acting. A cantor isn't acting, but they're fulfilling a role, both in themselves and as the leader of the community. The other thing that is also happening is this uh, call and response, right? This relationship between the cantor and the congregation, again, is a very, is one that is very uh, similar to what we have in performance art. And I want us just for a moment to listen uh, to this uh, beautiful sound piece. One moment. <laughs> So this uh, very short piece is actually from uh, Yemenite uh, uh, religious chanting, and this exists, uh, you know, way before contemporary and modern times, this back and forth, this call and response, once again, turning uh, the people of the congregation, shifting them from audience, from spectators, from viewers to part of what is uh, uh, going on. I want to end before, oh, we literally have two minutes. Um, just as an ending uh, slide, this is artist Kineret Chaya Max in a performance that I couldn't see myself because it opened uh, the day I flew away from Israel and it's closing this uh, Saturday. Uh, the, the name of the performance, as you can see, um, is expanding the ceremonial vessel. It's held in the uh, Contemporary Museum of uh, Batyam, and it's all around the vessel and the museum and the possibility to open ourselves and open the space of museums to actually receive and when I say to actually receive, it doesn't come with the question of what to receive, but to be receptive. What does it mean? And I think for me, this is a beautiful way to end because with all performance art, I think there is a shared responsibility between the commitment of the performer, sometimes to an extreme extent, and the invitation or demand of the viewers to let go of their role as viewers and become participants and engage with what's happening, whether it's by opening their heart and stepping in or by saying, this is too much up for me and leaving. In any case, the viewers themselves are uh, charged uh, with a choice that is very extreme within the art world and to me also very, very unique in the performance world. So um, I'm going to stop sharing, say hi to all of you. Um, huh. <laughs> now you see why I didn't do also Christianity. Yeah. You can take a, a, a moment to breathe, <laughs> take a sip of water because it was pretty intense. Wow. Also, there are so many artists and, and, and interesting artists that I think each one of them can probably develop in a, into a whole lecture. 
there's, there's so many things to, to say about and also about the connection to religion. Um, so of course you're welcome um, to um, share your questions in the chat. I have one or two questions that appeared during um, your talk. So uh, Sophia, I'm just gonna stop you for a moment. I'm gonna, while you're asking your questions, I'm gonna switch hats for a moment and I'm gonna be a CSP person and not an artist and educator. And I will say that if you haven't heard yet, uh, we designed, and when I say we, basically I got permission from Ari to do whatever I want. And I created an insane, amazing art tour in Israel that will be uh, going on May, uh, 2024, which is basically my dream trip. It's very condensed. It's nine days, eight, ni eight nights. It's only like a day and a half in Jerusalem. The rest is in the north and in Tel Aviv. We're capping it at 25 people. Uh, it's going to be stunning. If you're interested, email us. We'll send you the pre-launch package because we haven't launched it yet. Um, and if you're interested, put yourself on the interest list because then you can be first to sign up. And once it reaches 25 people, we're uh, stopping so it. Is there a link? Who should they send? There isn't a link yet so because it's literally pre-launch. You just email me at shirel uh, at OCCSP.net um, and we will send you the materials. It literally is pre-launch. Um, and I will say also that um, other than the amazing tour guide will be that will be guiding us through this trip, Gila Levitan, who some of you might know from the previous Israel trip, in this one, it's going to be also with me on the bus for the full nine days so that you have this duo power of uh, a tour guide and an art guide on the bus. And uh, yeah, so that was that. And now we can look at uh, questions. Okay. And Fantastic, sounds and amazing. I hope you come and visit me at the museum, um, but I don't know if that's on your list, you know, Shireen? Yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, um, uh, somebody asked here, what's the difference or, not, or dissimilar between performance art and conceptual art? Can you mm, talk a little bit about exactly, the connection yes. between the Yes, two? conceptual art can be in any medium where the concept is at the center of things rather uh, than the craftsmanship the, uh, um, or the medium. Uh, and performance art specifically, there are some very specific things about performance art. First of all, it happens in real time. Uh, once it's done, it's gone. Um, uh, it happens in real time. It involves the performer's body, uh, sometimes also objects and sound, but those are the two major things. And conceptual art can actually be also a painting or a sculpture or any of those. So performance art might be conceptual, but conceptual art can be basically in any medium. Um, yeah, and performance art, since it leans and takes from other mediums of the performing arts, right? Music, dance, and theater, it takes from them. It pulls them into the realm of visual arts. So there's also quite a large spectrum of what performance arts, art is. If you remember what I showed, the dinner dress, it's very theatrical. It has theater elements, whereas other performances are very much rooted in form. So uh, it's quite a large spectrum. Okay, so that was very interesting. I see the title asked an, a question, but you already answered it, saying that- But I will say there is quite a relationship between performance art and video art, and there are performances that are created for video, and they live in that world in between. Uh, that's something that I do myself, not only performance art, but also video art that is usually based on performance. Uh, like the things that are showing in my exhibition currently in downtown Santa Ana. I'm plugging in myself again. Of course, and you should all go and see and participate in your workshops. Uh, um, uh, yes, I, Shirel's email. Shirel, can you share your email in the chat? Yes, please? I'm, I'm, I'm just doing that in a moment and I'll put it in the chat so that you can email me uh, directly. One moment. Great. And if there are any, we're a little over time, but I'm fine for a few more minutes. If people wanna wanna ask questions, I'm happy to answer. Great, everybody was saying amazing, fantastic. Thank you so much. There were a lot of positive responses um, and many people, you got us very interested. 
Um, and also in a very um, delightful way, you explained, you know, how it developed, how the performance are, are developed and its social um, awareness that it developed with it. I think um, maybe I'll important. just mention uh, with the social awareness and activism and protest that performance art is definitely part of and going back to the comment of the narcissist aspect of performance art, I do want to suggest that we might think of performance art as something living between the world of profits and court gestures. Um, so maybe not narcissists, but people that are committed to mirror society in ways that are very extreme that aren't always uh, comfortable, whether they're very dramatic or whether they're full of humor. Um, I think between the prophet and the court jester, um, those are two aspects that I find myself thinking of uh, as, as kind of central to performance art. Um, yes, thank you very, very much, Shirel. Um, I, I enjoyed it very much. I hope you all too. We will be sending out the notes later on today, tomorrow. Um, yeah, and I think that's all. So thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Um, see you later on this week. Bye, Shirelle. See you. Bye. See you all. Goodbye.